Hi, I'm Doris Purchase, and welcome to Beyond the Frame, a podcast created just for you by Propeller Art Gallery, artists empowering artists in Toronto. Together, we'll take a deep dive into the hearts and minds of working visual artists today and their practice. In each episode, you will hear illuminating and intimate explorations of all things art, and you'll hear it in the artist's own voice. We'll talk process, inspiration, challenges, and much more. Everything you've ever wanted to know about art making or about the artists themselves happens right here. And I'm Tracy Thompson, sitting in for Doris Purchase, because today we welcome Doris Purchase. So let's sit back and have a listen, shall we? All right. Okay. I would like to mention, before I answer the question, that Tracy Thompson is the mind behind Beyond the Frame. She is the producer extraordinaire, the inventor of the question. The whole idea is Tracy's. So, on behalf of everyone involved at the Propeller Art Gallery, thank you, Tracy, for all that you have done. As a new member, you brought with you a huge gift. The podcast became an opportunity to come together during tough times and create something very special. I'm truly grateful for my part in the podcast as host voice, working with Propeller Marketing Team, and the chance to work with Phil Nguyen, who was our graphic design intern student, willing to work with me, my art, and for the cover. Most of all, I'm grateful for my friendship with Tracy that grew and grew out of this experience. I'm so proud to know her. It's hard to believe that this is the end of season one, 25 episodes for Propeller's 25th anniversary year. Tracy is promising a new season with new questions, so stay tuned for that. Meanwhile, listen again to all the episodes. Which ism is it? Under which ism would you classify your work? This is such a fun question. I'm sure it will be my longest answer, and I'm answering it as both an artist and art educator. I have a fascination with art periods, and many of those Western art history-isms informed my art practice. I was so seduced at a young age by the art, architecture, and frame from the Renaissance and Neoclassicism period. I secretly desired to have my art inside a fancy gold frame. A goal of mine was to make a picture worthy of being framed. And so, a frame obsession began. As I learned more about art periods, I was loving finding out that artists were these rebels who pushed boundaries, rejecting the old, and making change, which led me to another goal, that I might make change for art. It became very important to me that I move beyond the frame. Problematic on many levels, well, I've sort of moved beyond the frame, yeah. I still use the frame, but not to frame my pretty picture. What was really difficult for me was to move beyond realism, which was very important in my first art career. And it was a way to make money doing what I love. I took such slow, tentative moves, aspiring to make more interesting and more important work. Slowly, I transitioned into my second art career. So, to choose an ism, I need to choose more than one and with deep respect for the artists within those isms, starting with minimalism. Less is more. Because I'm making paintings without the paint, I would say that makes it minimal and non-representational too. I like to focus on a few basic elements, the canvas, wire, frame, and gesso. I call my pieces inversions since I mix up the traditional positions of these materials. You could also say my work stems from spatialism. Think Lucio Fontana, the artist who sliced his canvases with a knife, certainly a game changer. His art expressed gesture and performance. There is this point when I make some of my pieces where I need to cut the stretched canvas or the frame, and I always think of him. My practice also has qualities and characteristics of conceptualism. I aspire to have a strong, completely worked out idea in my mind, the idea being more important than the piece, 
which I can put together rather quickly because of all the pre-planning. I'm very influenced by many isms, and many of my art practices can be labeled as based in a particular period of art, including my realism years. My current practice fits quite solidly in contemporary art period, and not just because I'm alive and making art, but because my practice aligns with the philosophy of challenging our notions of what art is. Ironically, there is, technically, no need for an ism within contemporary art. The lack of an ism is as important as the embracing of diversity. So my practice can be many things, from an unmaker to a maker, from a subversive to an empirical. Anyway, for me, it's just fun to think about all of these things. Who's your muse? Influencers, educators, mentors, who has greatly inspired you? My great influencer is Spring Hurlbut. I first saw her work, Tree Columns, at the Oakville Galleries in 1990, after graduating from OCA. And then I saw her entablatures just after I graduated from Guelph University. I was a gallery attendant at the Oakville Galleries. I loved working there being able to have conversations with visitors and having the chance to spend long periods of time with the art to slowly, fully understand it. It gave me time to let Spring's art sink in and deeply influence me. It took years for me to fully understand how much it had, the striking beauty of the pieces, the way that she combined natural elements with man-made so poetically and architecturally deeply moved me. Spring's work awakened in me not only my passion for classical architecture, but I slowly began to look at the frames that I had been collecting in a new way. For me, Spring Hurlbut was and is a game changer. Her works for me are shockingly, wonderfully, peacefully beautiful. I've already mentioned some ism influences and artists. I have not yet mentioned Marcel Duchamp. His ready-made art, his idea of challenging the object's familiar purpose and adding a title that provokes new thought, giving permission to call pretty much anything art, a huge game changer. And yes, his urinal influenced me. I thought about things that were hidden, things not meant to be seen, or perhaps just not meant to be given much thought at all, and I felt they should be noticed. As far as educators inspiring me, it started in kindergarten, and it came in the form of all the support I was given. The simple words of encouragement from many teachers to continue on the path of art was very inspirational in a validating kind of way. Encouragement from family and friends has inspired me to believe in myself. My husband is my trusted advisor, helper, and important mentor for sure. My son inspires me to think more seriously than before about the future of the planet. For him and future generations, I want to make important art for a healthier planet, therefore a lot more reduce, reuse, recycling. Materials matter. What are your chosen favorite tools and preferred medium? Materials are so important in my practice. From a found frame with gnarled wire to scraps of wood and a stretcher, canvas hot off the roll, still smelling of the field, my trusty staple gun and canvas are all essential. I tend to put my work in the category of mixed media. Slump secrets. What methods do you employ to get yourself out of a slump? Ah, uh, getting out and going into a thrift store. Yard sale, hardware store, art supply store, looking at the backs of framed pieces, finding new materials, it all helps to get me more excited. It could be also simply tinkering with the stuff that I have in my toolbox. You can imagine I've missed out on a lot of this thrift store shopping supply days due to COVID. So my art is changing. I shall see if good things have come from staying at home as far as my art practice goes. I've been using more of what I already have, cut off, reusing old works. Honestly, it's not easy for me to get out of a slump. 
because it usually involves cleaning my studio, and that may take days to create space again. But then, oh, that clean studio re-inspires me and begs to be made messy again. Sometimes I succumb to the slump and nothing gets physically done. So I simply dream up pieces in my head or make notes, lists, and sketches. I suppose if I was kind to myself, I would say, I'm just taking a break. But mostly I feel depressed about not getting work made. Sometimes it's hard to pull away from the daily grind of chores. I need time away from the routine. Time alone helps me to get out of a slump. I do have a slump secret secret to share. I still paint once in a while. I have an art practice that I call couch art. This art is my go-to for relaxation and comfort. I can literally slump into my comfortable couch art. It's a place of nostalgia and love of floral patterns with a touch of humor. I paint on the cushy, upholstered surfaces with the press buttons, which I build, and after a little while, I'm out of a slump. I don't create many of these because I'm still working out how to make this more environmentally stable as a practice. At this point, it feels okay that I can use up old paint to finish the pieces, but we'll see. Working at the AGO is a wonderful place for me to get out of a slump. So much great art energy is within those beautiful walls. Posting something on Instagram has been a newish slump secret. It's amazing what a few likes will do for encouragement to keep going. Joining Propeller was very lucky. I joined just weeks before the pandemic hit. I dread to think of the slump I would have been if that hadn't happened. In the beginning... So tell me a bit about your process. Do you have a bag of tricks, lucky talismans, or habits? Where do you start? And more importantly, when do you stop? One trick is to look at my past work or lists, ideas, drawings in my sketchbook. I've gotten into the habit of going to bed early just so I can wake up early and enjoy a freshly rested mind and write out ideas and sketch what's been on my mind during the wee hours I've learned to embrace insomnia. Lucky talisman, anything that promises creative energy, I will put into my studio. I usually get them as gifts, such as gemstones and snake plants. I appreciate that my friends want to encourage my creativity. That in itself is what makes me feel lucky. The way that I stop is perhaps more interesting than how I start, because it all starts in my head. But how I stop is in stages. After I put together a piece, I leave it. I don't look at it for days or weeks. I come back to it and then decide if it needs a tweak, adjustment, or to be pushed further. Also, when I put on my painty clothes, that helps me mentally. I put those clothes on, and then I know I'm getting down to the business of art making. Calling all emo. What do you wish people to think or feel when they contemplate your work? My intention is to present a new understanding of some typical art gallery materials. By presenting materials such as the wire frame and canvas in a way that they are not traditionally used as supporting pieces for the painting, but the ways in which I invert them is to remind us that these components are the things we tend to ignore. They are not part of the making because they are to be out of sight, not important or subordinate. I present them as something that needs to be seriously contemplated. I often unmake them, break them, pull them apart so that people notice them. If after someone sees my work and walks away thinking about the world in a different way, fantastic. But how do I know if this happens? Well, I often don't, but sometimes I'm told, or I read what they have written. For example, at my Pint for Paragraph event, I find out what people think about my art pieces, and I love that these responses are usually a combination of the visceral and intellectual. I'm happy with what people are willing to share in general. I know it's not easy, so the positive feedback 
constructive criticism, even the negative responses, often affirm that I've created something important. The struggle is real. Talk to me about your biggest challenges as an artist. What methods do you use to overcome these challenges? My biggest challenge is the business side of art and self-promotion. The necessary writing and the confidence to submit, to call out, etc. I'm very grateful for Propeller Art Gallery and my member friends. The challenges feel shared and the support is shared too. Storage of art is another challenge. It helps that I'm now repurposing pieces and unmaking pieces. Picture perfect. In your opinion, what constitutes a perfect piece of art? And what qualities in your own work would signify a perfect work? For example, perfect composition, confident brushstrokes, illustrating a concept, or something else altogether? Well, I have seen perfection in other people's art but never in my own. And I don't expect to see perfection in my art. As a young artist, I worked very hard at copying other paintings that I felt were perfect. If I could copy them exactly or get an exact likeness of someone when creating a portrait, well, that was picture perfect in my mind. My attitude is very different now with the work that I'm doing. My personal expectation is, at the very least, to feel proud of myself. If I've solved an assemblage issue, as one example, and feeling good that what began as just an idea in my head is actually happening and the idea is being followed through on, it feels like a success. And to top it off, having the courage and opportunity to share it with the world is another success. Art Speak. How do you feel about titling, discussing, and explaining your work? Titling for me is more of a file management system. Sometimes I create a title that I consider a poetic addition to the piece, but not very often. As far as discussing my work, I try to keep it simple. I probably say too much. I should be quiet and wait for the viewer's response and just allow the work to be open to interpretation. Because I'm not very good at writing, I'm not a fan of art speak. So it's pretty easy for me to avoid that. I do, however, like words such as liminal and interstitial, particularly when talking about art. Those are words I can appreciate when it comes to talking about art. I recognize that the best art is usually in a sweet spot, something you might find hard to explain or figure out, and it's usually because the art speaks to many things or is not quite one thing or the other. I feel that a little explaining goes a long way. And if there is too much explaining, you usually lose your audience. The best art discussions usually happen when minds are open to new ideas. I have certainly enjoyed being a part of this podcast and have enjoyed hearing other artists discuss and explain their work. I do feel that it is a good artist practice to answer these questions, even if it's difficult. I'm very grateful to Tracy for asking them. Frankly, I need this kind of push. Heavy metal or classical? What do you listen to while you work? Or is silence your thing? Oh, silence is preferred, particularly when I need to hear my own thoughts. But if I'm simply on task, for example, stretching canvases, I like to listen to early country music, you know, before new country the pioneers of country. Regardless of music, I choose if I feel like I'm disappearing, I might need to turn on the radio, listen to the news, or hear a podcast story. I'm not sure why, but that place when I'm just getting into the flow scares me a bit. I feel I have too many responsibilities to stay many hours away from reality and absorbed in art making. I feel guilty when that starts to happen. Kind of selfish. One reason I wear a watch, even to bed, and it's an indiglo, is that it keeps me from getting lost in time and space. Why for art thou? Why do you make art? Good question, because I self-identify as an artist. And as an art educator, 
I know the importance of art for people. And what choice do I have? Being an artist was and is the only thing I consider myself good at. As a kid, if I was ever asked what I wanted to be, I would say, I want to be an artist. I do question why I make art. It's not easily understood, colorful, or sellable. I've always wanted to be financially secure. I'm very debt adverse. Through a high school co-op course, I was hired as a paste-up artist and was heading on the graphic design path. It's become a matter of permitting myself to be a fine artist or visual artist, asking myself, can I support myself by making art? It seemed that graphic design work, mural painting, and faux finishing would be the way to go. I needed to know that I could earn a living as an artist in a practical way and have enough financial stability so that eventually I could make art pieces that will be important, contributing, and serious work, even if just in my own terms. And so, if I could put these pieces out into the world, regardless of whether or not they would sell easily, I think I'm getting there, slowly, slowly. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Frame, a PAG podcast. To hear more episodes and to view the artist's works, please visit www.propellerartgallery.ca. Hosted by Doris Purchase, produced by Tracy Thompson, and recorded at the Orange Lounge Studio in Toronto. Also, the Propeller Art Gallery recognizes the presence of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron-Wendat Nations. We acknowledge we are hosted on land governed by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, the Two-Row Wampum Treaty, and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are committed to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you for listening.